Jo. Uh. <lacht> Freunde der Teewelt, Silly Hood am Start. Wo sind die Kühe hin? Chaos. Hier, okay. Ähm, ja, wir sind hier auf Lasergurkenland, dem Minecraft Vanilla Anarchie Server. Äh, mit der IP 149202127134. Ähm, jetzt kostenlos connecten, nur diesen Monat. Ähm, und Gewinne absahnen. Obwohl, eigentlich kann man immer kostenlos connecten, aber ja, dies ist ein Werbevideo mit leeren Versprechen, deswegen wisst ihr Bescheid. Äh, genau, und was ich mich schon immer mal gefragt habe, ist, wenn man wenn man so voll einen auf Safety macht und so, und sich so, und sich so denkt, yo, ich traue Windows nicht, Windows ist böse, und das spioniert mich aus und so. Und dann sagen wir mal, dass wegen auf eine Open Source Alternative umsteigt, wie Linux beispielsweise. Und dann sich so denkt, ja, das ist ja Open Source, da kann ich mir all den Code anschauen und dann äh, weiß ich, dass es nicht böse ist. Dann geht man dahin und liest sich alle 2 Millionen Zeilen Code vom Linux Kernel durch und dann noch von der Distribution obendrauf, die man halt verwendet. Und wenn man dann jede einzelne Zahl der Verstanden gecheckt und äh, überprüft hat und auf Sicherheitslücken gescannt hat, kann man sich einfach die ISO irgendwo im Internet runterladen und sein System starten. Was ich mich allerdings gefragt habe ist, naja, also wenn, wenn man sich einfach das pre OS runterlädt und dann vertraut man ja wieder, dass nicht irgendwer da eine Backdoor reingepackt hat. Ne? Also jetzt keine Offense an die Distributor von den, iOS, von den ISOs, von den Linux-Distributionen, die sind teilweise wahrscheinlich schon recht äh, vertrauenswürdig. Aber jetzt mal nur so, wenn man, sagen wir mal, ein skeptischer Verbraucher ist, dann wäre es natürlich eigentlich die Option, dass man da hingeht und sagt, ja, ich kompiliere mir mein Betriebssystem selber, das machen ja auch viele, ist auf jeden Fall ein Ding. Weil dann kann ich mir ja zu 100% sicher sein, dass da der Code drin ist, den ich gelesen habe der C-Code, in dem wahrscheinlich die Distribution geschrieben ist, oder zumindest der Kernel, jetzt in dem Beispiel von Linux. Äh, gut, jetzt macht natürlich jeder Compiler was anderes mit C-Code, weil C ist natürlich ziemlich high level, die Stars und die einzelnen Machine Instructions sehen dann ein bisschen anders aus, aber allzu viel wird da wahrscheinlich nicht schief gehen. Es ist nur die Sache, dass ich ich habe mir mal so die Gedanken gemacht, dass man da ja dann eigentlich sicher ist, so im Leben. Aber man muss sich ja überlegen, dass der Compiler auch einfach nur ein kompiliertes Programm ist, das auch eine Backdoor drin haben könnte, die wiederum eine Backdoor in das Betriebssystem setzt. Und da dieser Compiler auch von den Leuten verwendet wird, die das Betriebssystem entwickeln, wird auch der Compiler nicht als Virus erkannt oder wird auch oder ist es alles ziemlich gut versteckt, weil wenn, wenn, der, wenn man dem Compiler nicht trauen kann, dann ist es kritisch. So, dann kann man natürlich sagen, ich compile den Compiler selber, aber wer schon mal versucht hat, irgendwie GC, GCC zum Beispiel selber zu kompilieren, yikes! Also, da bist du ja wild am Dependencies bauen und so weiter und das sind halt dann teilweise so Sachen wo, also als ich mal versucht habe GCC zu bauen ist einfach wild, weil da waren irgendwelche Fehler weil das halt so Code ist, der gerade so die Edge Cases vom Compiler selber austestet und äh, teilweise auch Compiler Bugs findet naja, mal abgesehen davon, was verwendet man, um einen Compiler zu kompilieren, natürlich eine ältere Version des Compilers und so weiter. Also, ich meine, 
wenn man wirklich niemanden vertraut, dann äh, wie, wie weit zurück geht man, bis man sicher sein kann, dass man die volle Kontrolle darüber hat, was auf dem System passiert. Weil wenn wirklich in irgendeinem Compiler ganz unten drinnen von vielleicht einer mächtigen Three-Letter-Agency installiert eine gewiefte Backdoor ist, die sich weiterhin über die Compiler-Version fortsetzt und dann dementsprechend die Betriebssysteme, die daraus kompiliert werden, so modifiziert, dass man diese Backdoor nicht finden kann, weil dann zum Beispiel diese, äh, dieser Speicher nicht angezeigt wird, auch wenn man es irgendwie mit einem Debugger oder so analysiert, wird es einfach vom Betriebssystem, weil das selber geflawed ist, nicht angezeigt. So, das war... Das war mal so eine Weltverschwörungstheorie, die ich hatte. Und passend dazu pumpen wir heute den DEFCON Talk äh, 26 von Second äh, Zech, Zech, Zach, Scheiße, Zech, Rip an meine Pronunciation mal wieder. Zach and Alex infecting, it's, it's Zach, oder? Äh, ja, wir hören es ja gleich wahrscheinlich, die stellen sich hier vor. Äh, Infecting the Embedded Supply Chain. Ne, Supply Chain, also als ich diesen Titel gelesen habe, ich habe natürlich noch nicht reingehört in den Talk hier, als ich den... Oh! Hä? Bin ich so schnell gerackt oder ist der einfach ultra weit neben mir explodiert? Äh... Ja, also... Ne? Und als ich Supply Chain gelesen habe, dachte ich mir schon so, das hat, das hat mich halt daran erinnert. Also es wird wahrscheinlich nicht meine Verschwörungstheorie sein, weil wahrscheinlich niemand so eine blöde Verschwörungstheorie hat wie ich. Und, ähm, ach, das ist die Kritz Poison, ne? Ähm, weil wahrscheinlich nie jemand, weil irgendwo meine Theorie ist wahrscheinlich ein Design Flaw, was wahrscheinlich keinen Sinn macht. Wahrscheinlich ist es, ich... Ich weiß nicht, wie technisch anstrengend das wäre. Schon, schon ziemlich. Und es wird ja alles wahrscheinlich auch akribisch überprüft. Aber wie, wie ihr schon merkt, ne, es wird wahrscheinlich akribisch überprüft. Äh, es gibt wahrscheinlich Leute, die wissen, wie genau das funktioniert. Aber viele vermutlich nicht. Ne? Und, äh, ja, keine Ahnung. Also... Bla, die bla, deswegen, also nicht deswegen, ich wollte nur diese Geschichte kurz in den Raum werfen, da wir heute äh, Infecting the Embedded Supply Chain pumpen. Und was hier lustig ist, Global Supply Chain Council ist hier äh, in den Kommentaren, Funny Bunny. Oh, <lacht> es ist das einzige Kommentar. <lacht> okay. Ähm, ja, also, ne, Supply Chain. Ich, ich weiß nicht, ob mit Supply Chain das gemeint ist mit... Also ich dachte so, weißt du so, ne? Compiler, Compiler, Compiler. Ist das eine Supply Chain? Ich habe keine Ahnung, was eine Supply Chain ist. Jedenfalls pumpen wir das heute. Let's go. Ne? Hier Und könnt ihr kurz mal die Speaker in sehen. Ne? In drei Pixeln. Oh, hier. Hier, ne? Zack und Alex, keine Ahnung, wer wer ist und wie man die ausspricht, aber let's go. For coming and giving a talk at DEF CON. So, help me welcome Zach and Alex to their first talk. Woo! Cheers. Yeah! Cheers. And their talk is that infecting the embedded supply chain. I was telling them on the walk over here, I haven't read your abstract, but just from the title, I saw that and I'm like, yeah. Alter, wie ihr gerade gemacht habt, dachte ich, da ist ein Creeper. <lacht> habt ihr das gehört? Ich habe mir das gerade das Herz stehen geblieben. <lacht> Geil. Hammer. Can you guys hear us? Oh yeah. Hey, this is uh, infecting the embedded supply chain. So, disclaimer. Um, oh, oh, oh. We thought we had a 45 minute slot, but we actually have 20 minutes. So, we're gonna try our best to condense everything within that 20 minutes. So, we have a couple of videos. Great. Um, which we'll try to do. We'll try to get to everything. Um, but if we don't make it to everything, we'll post everything to our website, summersetrecon.com, and we'll have proof of concept code on GitHub as well. So, you guys can check that out. Um, I'm Zach. Um, like I said, I work at Somerset Recon. I do a combination of 
web application pen testing and reverse engineering. I specialize in vulnerability research and exploit development. Oh, sense cadet. Ooh, I'm fuck. Alex. Uh, I'm a Ooh. barista that occasionally does security things at some set recon. Uh, I enjoy making cappuccinos, hardware hacking, and reverse engineering. Oh, cappuccinos is also some classic. Um, um, just a little bit about Somerset Recon. We are a security consultancy based out of, of San Diego. We specialize in web applications, mobile applications, and embedded device security. Um, and you can find out more about us at somersetrecon.com. And our Twitter. Cool. So aside from our day-to-day -day work, we also like to do uh, some cool side projects, uh, one of which was an electronic safe, uh, safe block that we looked at. Um, that allowed you to uh, either enter in a pin manually to unlock a safe or you know, over Bluetooth on uh, your uh, favorite mobile device. Um, we found some vulnerabilities there, including being able to decode pins wirelessly over the air and replay them. And also um, we reversed the uh, wire protocol and yeah. created a brute force. Um, That's so nice for that. Um, we also did work on the Hello Barbie, which is an IoT doll that um, kids can talk to and have a full conversation with. Um, we looked at all the uh, web services and reversed the mobile application and pretty much just figured out how that all worked and I found some vulnerabilities and made a white paper, which is online as well. So um, these are all embedded devices and that's primarily what we focus on uh, on our side research. And so when we decided to do this research, we wanted to do something slightly different but touched on it still. Um, so we tried to look at what all these projects had in, in common and we thought why not look at their uh, you know the tools used to program and debug them. Um, War der so this is our noch? target. Uh, uh. We focused on the Sega J-Link which is a, a pretty popular device. Um, on both the hardware ah, ich das nicht and mal software used to control it. Ah, ich hab's weggemacht, hat um, dank Herrn Stein und der, ich uh, bin with, uh, device that komplett lost and to an der Stelle. Like mobile device, for instance, uh, over a JTAG, uh, SWD, etc. Um, it's an in-circuit emulator and an in-circuit uh, system programmer, so it can program chips. It primarily supports uh, ARM and ARM Cortex chips, but also supports uh, some others like Renaissance. Um, it communicates with a host uh, computer over USB and Ethernet, which is kind of interesting. Has a cross-platform toolchain uh -huh. and some other cool features. Um, and the Sega J-Links are the most widely used line of debug probes available today, which is a quote from them. That's kind of cool. <laughs> um, other than hardware, they create a ton of software, um, including like the software package that's used to control the J-Links themselves. They also have a GDB server, um, RTOS plugin source development kit, um, a couple of real time analysis visualization tools, and a graphical debugger. Um, we primarily focused on the software suite used to control these JLink devices, and this package just includes a ton of tools, including uh, JLink Commander, which is like your typical command line tool that you would use with most debuggers. Um, a GDB server, a remote server, which allows a client to connect to a JLink commander session um, within the local also, network, uh, a memory viewer, and a flashing tool to just flash. So a typical setup looks like this. You have a host PC that has a software suite installed, and you're communicating to this JLink device over USB and Ethernet, and then you connect it to your client target over JTAG device. So in terms of attack surface, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, this company makes a lot of different products. Um, the hardware debug probes themselves were interested in firmware and, you know, uh, how that works. And also, can you infect the debug probe itself or can the debug probe infect um, the end device that you're trying to uh, target? Uh, and then in addition to that, there's a lot of software attack surface as well. It, there's a USB driver that's included with this device, as well as a host of different user mode applications that are run. And in addition to that, which is also a pretty interesting thing, they have a custom IDE that's also used to develop applications for the JLink. So, hardware. Yeah, so we're interested in how the hardware works, um, extracting firmware, how easy is it to do that? How does the firmware work? Um, the feature differences between each of the devices, because Segger makes a ton of different types of J-Links um, at different price points, of course. And we're wondering, like, are there hardware differences or is it just firmware? And um, with these devices, what are the security mechanisms that are on it? 
is the device open? Can I flash an open source version of firmware, or can I modify firmware and flash the debug probe? So this is a typical JLink EDU. It's kind of like the cheapest consumer end uh, JLink you can get. Um, if we focus here and open again, you can see that it is also an ARM device. So the, in, the tool that's used to debug and program ARM embedded devices is also an ARM embedded device, which is, yeah, that's, that's pretty nice. Um, then we started looking for, you know, uh, debug ports and found a tag connect, which is uh, kind of like, it, it's kind of like a JTAG header, but um, a proprietary connector that has pogo pins. So also der Talk ist irgendwie so gefühlt ganz was anderes, als was ich erwartet habe. Aber let's see. Why not try debugging a JLink with a JLink? So it turns out that the security and flash bits are set, so that's good. Um, the flash bit basically means that you can't reprogram the device unless you erase uh, flash, um, which you can't do because the security bit is set, which basically says uh, you can't debug this chip. So it refuses to connect and erase. We we're looking for other ways around this, so we needed to go deeper. So we took a, a look at some of the other uh, JLink debug probes, and the JLink Mini EDU has an interesting feature in um, its ARM chip, which is called the backdoor key access, <laughs> which is an opt-in um, feature that basically, if you provide the chip with the proper key, it will like willingly disable the security bit, and then you can kind of do whatever you want with the device, which is pretty cool. So then we began really looking at some of the uh, desktop software that was distributed with the Segger JLink for security vulnerabilities. We started out just doing some high level reverse engineering. We uh, noticed that they distributed their software to both Linux and Windows systems. In reverse engineering this, we determined that they were using cross compiled code. So that eliminated some redundant work uh, where the uh, only one of the operating system versions really needs to be reverse engineered to determine the functionality and vulnerable per portions of the code. We also noticed that they were using some custom string manipulation code, which was somewhat interesting, and we'll talk a little bit about that more later. Um, we also noticed that they used a lot of dangerous functions. They used string copy, string cat, and a lot of other things that don't check the length of the destination Ew. buffer. From the point of binary protections, Seger opted into most binary protection. Uh, However, they did uh, leave out both PIE and stack canaries in their Linux executables. So once we had that, we began setting up some fuzzers in order to uh, test the different input vectors, see if we could find any uh, vulnerabilities that we could begin to exploit. So we tested all the input vectors that these applications seem to accept. We tested files, both network interfaces, and command line arguments that they accepted. Yeah, at least this here is so nice. Since um, our reversing revealed that there were some really interesting uh, code paths that were somewhat deep and required magic numbers and different things to reach, we decided to use a generational fuzzy approach, so we used Peach for that. Um, because we got tons of crashes and uh, began to be exactly exploiting them. So the first thing is the custom string formatting. We noticed in uh, looking into this, some interesting usages, such as shown here, where if it were a standard string formatting function, it would be a format string vulnerability. So we began looking into that a little bit more. So the custom string formatting that they implemented used most of the basic format specifiers, such as percent %s, percent %n, percent %d, etc. Um, but they did custom. not accept the percent %n that's typically used in format string vulnerabilities. Um, so with that, we were able to uh, do some of the format string uh, exploits. We were able to do arbitrary reads, as shown here. However, due to the fact that it lacked the percent %n specifier that's used to write bits, we were not able to turn this into an arbitrary write. I also found in the uh, JLink commander tool, which we talked about earlier, it's a command line tool, um, there's a feature called command file, which basically you can feed JLink Commander a uh, script to kind of set up your environment before you start uh, debugging your device. And this, uh, the um, file parsing code had a vulnerability, which was a traditional stack buffer overflow. And so in the image, you can see that we kind of just feed a bunch of A's into a payload, and then we pass it into JLink DXC, and it just set faults. So if you triage that in GDB, you can see that it 
um, it tries to return to address 41, 41, 41, 41. Classic. 41 so is A in the courses are in ASCII. And we were able to create a POC for um, the like five wissen. basic steps, which is take over the return address, get the address of the C, use that pointer to get the address of the system, and call system with arguments and that code execution. Uh, we won't be able to go over the POC because of time, but Ultimately, uh, ja, ist, got, irgendwie ist es jetzt viel ungemütlicher mit dem Bett hier geworden, aber ja, keine Ahnung. I386 and AD64 Linux systems, and it's a rock with ASLR bypass, return to libc, and reverse shell is very doable, but requires rocking in libc a lot. But the general idea is with this attack that an attacker can Fuck. create a malicious uh, command file and dummy firmware and send an e urgent email. Um, but this is an attachment to a developer at a targeted company. So developer, developers are typically pressed for time, so they'll probably run this with JLint Commander and it'll pop a shell and return back to the attacker. Um, we also found uh, in the same binary, we found light, huh? a, another file, file parsing vulnerability in the settings file flag, which is very similar to command file, um, but it's in a completely different area. Uh, it's in a library called uh, JLint arm.so, and that's where a lot of like the arm specific code is in or like uh, uh, the JLink software suite. Um, and this is in particular you the auch meine Tür DSS handeln. segment. So you can use this to kind of override function pointers. Yeah, auf jeden Fall the DSS idea. segment. We also got RCE, which is cool. So after that, we started looking at uh, a really interestingly named executable called JLink Remote Server. So once we saw this, we kind of perked up a little bit and began trying to look at the functionality of this executable. So running a basic net set, we noticed that it was listening on a number of ports, and particularly of interest to us was it looked like it was listening as a telnet server. So we wanted to figure out if this was actually having a telnet server embedded in the executable or what was going on there. So a little bit of reverse engineering revealed that they actually had embedded a telnet server within their executable. So it allows users within the network to uh, connect to this JLink server and uh, do remote debugging. So we began fuzzing this and uh, noticed a really interesting crash where we had overwritten the uh, instruction pointer with AAAA, which is always good. Uh, we did a little bit of reverse engineering and triage on this and picked up a couple things. It was the stack buffer overflow that we were able to trigger remotely. We were not able to get the crashes to be consistent due to race conditions within the executable. We had a fairly limited amount of stack space to work with if we were going to build a ROP chain. We were limited the to glitches sind von denen, and full again, blame we had auf den talk. And NS enabled on this executable, auf but PIE was not enabled. Auf, no, whatever. So we used typical exploitation techniques. We used ROP to bypass DNX. And then with a ROP chain, we did a dereference of the GOT in order to leak the address of libc. From there, we could calculate the offset of system and then do a return to libc. Um, the main issue that we ran into here was we wanted to send arbitrary attacker controlled payloads to the system. And we had trouble kind of getting the user controlled strings to consistently be passed in the system. So we realized that user controlled data was being stored in one of two locations in the executable. And due to a race condition, we couldn't determine if it were going to be in one location or the other. So we tried to figure out if there was some way we could make it more consistent. And we came up with the following. So we sort of called this space sleds, where we were inspired by the not sled techniques, in which knots are prepended to a shellcode payload. Herr, also Nobs erklärt und all den anderen Kram nicht, oder was? Tunneling mode from a 
remote computer into the, your network and allows remote debugging. Even when they're not in, within the... Phone. In the local network, correct. So our first thought at that point was, I wonder what type of authentication they're using, if there's um, any weaknesses there or anything that we could exploit. So as you can kind of see here, they use magic numbers and your device serial number to um, authenticate your device. Uh, so that was a pretty, uh, pretty scary thing. So when you uh, run your JLink remote server uh, with your JLink device attached, it sends a magic number and registers your JLink debugger with the server, and then it allows client connections to specify the serial number of the device that they hope to connect to. Good. So we looked at the serial numbers and realized that there were one bill or 10 billion possibilities, which would make brute forcing all of the connected serial numbers a bit infeasible. So we wondered, is this actually something that would be a potential attack? Is there some way that an attacker could shrink the space of serial numbers that they would attempt to brute force? So we were, began looking into, is there some format that Steger uses for their Is there like some smaller range or number that they start at that we could use to shrink the space? So we Googled Steger JLink and found tons of images that people had posted online that included their device serial number. <laughs> Uh, we called some people that we know that also had Steger J-Links and asked their device serial number. And in the end, we got about 30 J-Link serial numbers that we were able to analyze and started to notice a few patterns that emerged. So the first two digits of the serial numbers were correlated oh, with no, the model that we still device, want to whether you had a J-Link Pro or a J-Link Mini. After that, two digits for the version, where if Steger would release a slightly updated version, that would increment. And then finally, the last uh, five digits are a so device unique number the that's incremented. Come, wenn man nicht so schläft, so weit doing weiß, a little bit of analysis oh on the numbers that we had, we were able to shrink the serial number space and still achieve what we think would be very good coverage with only 100,000 serial numbers. And assuming about 10 serial numbers per second to be brute force, which is about the length that we saw the connections taking with the um, when it was done properly via the JLink application, it would take the time from 31 years to brute force the space to about three hours. The impact here really is once you make a connection via this server, you can do all sorts of things. You can flash new firmware, you could read existing or read the existing firmware, or make any sort of malicious modifications to the connected devices. So we uh, disclosed here, and we're really pleased with the response. They responded right away and within a week and uh, it Stop. was very uh, we even received a thank you from the founder and CTO of the company That's so cool. in conclusion we just really realized that there's a, these devices are oftentimes lacking and a lot of the protections and security that we would hope from a, a device piece of the supply chain it was like the so uh, uh, so point exploitation much more difficult as well as having lacking the security features that are just architectural architectural and no authentication in the uh, remote server or anything like that cool well, wait there's more okay before we run out of time um we revisited uh the jlink hardware um but instead from uh instead of have from the perspective of trying to manipulate the firmware with a hardware debugging device uh from the ota process um, we realized that if you download a, a newer version of the JLink uh, software suite, uh, JLink Commander will ask you if you want to update your JLink debug probe. And so we started from the network perspective and found that there, were, there was no firmware blobs being transferred over the network and we thought that was kind of interesting. So uh, we eventually figured out where firmware was being um, stored and how the update process worked. Um, and we reverse the USB protocol to be able to uh, flash the uh, JLink devices. To Hurensohn. Um, and it turns out that the JLink device, Wee, du wirst um, mich hier runter. when it's being flashed over USB, it does do a firmware check, Ruh. but it's not very good. And it uses dates to check whether our firmware is valid. So this could be a bad thing. Um, also, firmware is not signed and can be modified. So in the end, um, we don't have time for the video, but um, we, to illustrate it, we created a piece of malware that runs on Windows. It runs silently in the background, 
and just any JLink device that is connected via USB, it immediately flashes and completely breaks. <laughs> By um, flashing um, firmware that's set like way far in the future, and you can't fix your device unless you have like hardware debugging um, privileges. And that's it. Cool. Ja, Leute, ähm, ihr wisst Bescheid, das war es dann auch äh, von meiner Seite. Oh, ich habe einen Link Alright. geklickt. Whoops. So, we have two. Äh, hier, das war auf Lasergruppen Land, 1092 schaut doch mal vorbei, der Server ist wahrscheinlich noch online, sehr, sehr wahrscheinlich, ich plane ihn noch sehr lange online zu lassen. Und äh, in dem unwahrscheinlichen Fall, dass ich den Server in den nächsten paar Jahren ausmache, werde ich die Map veröffentlichen, das heißt, ihr könnt da gerne spielen. Und äh, wenn ich den nicht mehr hoste, könnt ihr den gerne weiter hosten. Ähm, also jetzt gratis Microphone überspielen. Äh, wenn ihr ein Haus bauen wollt, geht ein bisschen weiter weg. Wir haben gepumpt DEFCON 26 von Zack and Alex Infecting the Embedded Supply Chain. Ja, wir sehen uns wieder in der nächsten Werbefolge. Tschüss!